Very exciting to see everyone. My name is Albert Chan, a member of the MIT Alumni Club. We organize some of these events for our community, so it's really great to see all of you here. Despite the fears of power, out power outages, you guys still made it. Or maybe because you are trying to figure out batteries, so maybe that's why you're here. <laughs> Either way, it's good to see you. We're sold out, as you can see. Um, so I think we're going to have a phenomenal speaker, and, and we're in for a real treat. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you didn't see, the restrooms are to the back, um, to your right, and so if you need that, um, that's where they are. Second thing is the agenda today is fairly simple. We have about an hour presentation from our speaker, and that'll be followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A. We'll start with a few questions that you submitted online, and then we'll open it up to, to um, audience questions here. Um, the third thing of housekeeping was for people who haven't been here to park before, I just want to let you know that they are a research company around innovation, and they are especially uh, relevant to us. Um, they've been great partners to the MIT Alumni Club, and they do things like incubate startups. They um, do research in specific areas, contract researching, um, and they also hire top-notch researchers. So that might be interesting to some of you, so check them out if that's relevant to you. So now to the main event. For many of you um, in the MIT community, Professor Yet Ming Chang needs no introduction. Um, but I'll give a few words in, in case you wanted a refresher. He is an M MIT person through and through. I think if, if he bled, he would bleed beaver, if that's possible. <laughs> He uh, completed his bachelor's at MIT and then his doctorate at MIT, and right, at, right after that, he became a professor in the material science department, and so he's been at MIT for 43 years. Wow. Yep, so let's give him a round of applause just for that. Um, because of that dedication, he, he decided to marry someone who was also an MIT alum. <laughs> His sister is an MIT alum, and her and brother-in-law is an MIT alum, and so yeah, it, it goes back deep here. <laughs> um, in case you were wondering, you probably already know this, but his research focuses on advanced materials, and he's one of the premier experts uh, in the world on energy storage. He serves on numerous government and academic advisory committees, and especially interesting to some of you and me as well, he is a co-founder of numerous companies, um, many of which are storage companies, including A123, 24M, and most recently, Form Energy. Um, so with that, let's all give Professor Chang a warm welcome. Terrific. All right. What Albert uh, didn't mention is that three times in my life I tried to move to California. <laughs> I never made it. Right? The first time I ended up going to MIT instead of to California. When I finished my undergraduate degree, I applied to all the California graduate schools. And uh, my uh, thesis advisor got me hooked on a, a new project at that time, which made me stay. When I finished my PhD, as I was approaching the end, I thought I would come, you know, move to California. And uh, MIT offered me a job. And so once again, I, I was stymied. Right? <laughs> so uh, these days, I, you know, I'm in the Bay Area roughly twice a month, though. So uh, I, I'm, I'm getting my, uh, the California, my taste of Cali California vicariously. So uh, I'm going to talk about energy storage. And this is a, um, uh, this is a little bit of a uh, uh, over-the-top title. You know, I'm, I don't know what the future of energy storage is. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to uh, tell you about some things that we're doing that are interesting uh, to me. And uh, just to, you know, so the disclaimer is that uh, it's going to be mostly from the point of view of a, a material scientist. Right? And so what that means is that in each of these cases I've, uh, that I'll talk about, I've tried to find a rather narrow, specific problem that, if we can solve, has a lot of leverage over a larger problem. And so that'll be the nature of what I talk about. Um, all these logos down at the bottom are uh, folks that I have uh, gotten great intellectual stimulation from. Right? And a few of them I've even gotten money from as well. Right? <laughs> okay? But the more important part is the intellectual stimulation. Okay. All right. So uh, before I start, I want to act, uh, give you the, you know, the report from MIT. 
MIT is doing fabulously well. I don't know when the last time uh, you, you were there was. Uh, I think we have some recent uh, some challenges, as you all have been reading about, and I think we'll get through those. But uh, you know, the brand name of MIT has never been better than it is uh, after, and I've been there 43 years. Right? And so uh, where I wanted to begin not talking about stories just yet, but to tell you about uh, a recent study uh, that was done uh, a few years ago on innovation at MIT that led to some of the new things that are happening now, such as you know, the engine you've all uh, heard about. But um, I was on a committee, a uh, committee on innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, Vladimir Bulovic, who some of you may know, a professor of uh, electrical engineering, uh, is responsible for this data, so I want to give him uh, credit for it. And so I'm going to assume everybody in this room uh, you know, knows the MIT campus intimately. <laughs> 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 There's the MIT campus. Right? So now, if you go through the MIT campus and uh, you know, look for uh, you know, uh, hallmarks of innovation, patents are an imperfect measure. Everybody will agree. Right? And especially, you see the asterisk at the bottom. You know, computer science, not well represented by uh, patents, innovation in that area. But it's, it's something you can measure. And so this is the density of patents uh, on, uh, across the MIT campus. Uh, I would not be showing you this if it weren't for the fact that Building 13, my building, <laughs> is the highest bar. Right? Yeah. OK. Um, there's some you know, interesting data here. So look out there at uh, building E25. That's the third highest bar. E25 is one individual, Bob Langer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the rest of us have to you know, work together. <laughs> Bob does it all by himself. Right? So uh, you know, the, one of the reasons for this study was the question, you know, what is it that uh, on the MIT campus that creates innovation? Right? So next chart I'll show you is by department. OK? And the horizontal axis is number of inventors, number of patents. Right? And then patents per inventor is the green bar. And so if you look at the longest uh, green bar there, you're going to say physics. Physics? <laughs> right? And so who, who here is uh, from, from course eight? There's a few of you. OK, so that's an outlier for the following reason. <laughs> There's uh, one faculty member who patents at a very, very high rate, and that's John Joannopoulos. Right? So again, an individual that dominates the department. We have Bob Langer dominating the entire building, and we have John Joannopoulos you know, <laughs> dominating the department. But uh, after John, then there's material science and engineering. So you know, we're, we're, we're proud of, uh, uh, of, of that metric. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that characterizes the most inventive places on the MIT campus is the, uh, the extent to which you collaborate. Right? So this is not, this is not uh, new. And many of you probably uh, know that uh, such relationships exist. But if you look at the number of inventors per patent versus number of patents, it's not a peak at one. So this concept of the lonely sole inventor really isn't true. Right? It's when people work together that they invent. Right? And so this is the MIT faculty, right? Uh, the patents issued the MIT faculty. But if you just take the two buildings, 13 and, and 3, <laughs> right? you see the message is that we collaborate more. Right? Now that's the reason, that's you know, at least a correlation there. Right? OK. All right. And uh, now, uh, so uh, there's buildings 13 and 3, then there's course 3. And uh, just to give you a snapshot of, uh, of uh, material science and engineering, this is 1987 to roughly 2017. And so I don't honestly know the statistics for other departments, but this gives you a snapshot. So uh, our department has uh, founded 46 companies between 1987 to uh, 2017. And now, as of 2019, it's probably uh, right around 50. Right? And so uh, this, we're proud of this. Of course, three is proud of this. And uh, we think it's, it's a measure of our impact. And so uh, MIT is, takes innovation very seriously, and more so than certainly when I was an undergraduate or graduate student. And the, all what you will uh, you hear about now and will continue to hear about are the things that are being done around MIT. The engine is a new uh, incubator, but the difference is that the engine is also a venture fund. 
Right? So they don't just give you space, they actually give you funds as well. And that recently uh, announced a tenfold expansion in, in, in footprint. Right? Very close to MIT. Right? Right. So, okay, um, on, to, uh, on to the main topic. Right? So uh, I work on uh, problems related to energy and environment that I uh, think that material science can play a role in. Right. And the, the fact that I ended up in this area was, is somewhat of a surprise because when I was you know, uh, learning the field of material science and engineering, uh, that, was not, that was not the uh, ambition. Uh, but this has been a, really a, a great area in which to, you know, to practice you know, my field and to feel that we, you know, we are making headway against the big problems that we have. And so this is a slide, I, a chart I borrowed from uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and you see the large parts of this pie here. And so uh, uh, transportation, so electric vehicle batteries, and, and someday uh, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft batteries. Uh, we work in that area, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, uh, electricity, uh, uh, you know, electrical storage for the grid. Right? Uh, that's a second area. So I'm going to talk about it in that order. You know, batteries for transportation, batteries for the grid. And then you look at two other very large uh, p uh, pieces of the pie here. Right? We've actually started to work on this part called industry. And so I'm going to, uh, at, towards the end, tell you a bit about a new project on cement. Right? And so. Uh, it turns out cement, you know, don't laugh. Cement is a fascinating material, right? <laughs> that great stuff that we uh, all use so much of. And the part I haven't figured out how to tackle is the, the, the one in the uh, lower uh, right there, agriculture and forestry, right? So I do that at a, at a personal level. Uh, that's, you know, our backyard. Uh, we raise chickens and bees. And so what you're seeing there is, you know, a highly engineered, uh, what is called the chicken tractor, designed by me, uh, my wife, also a PhD from MIT, and a friend of ours, Scott Gattuso, also a PhD. And so this is a very highly designed uh, <laughs> tractor, engineered to be moved uh, to, so that it can be moved by a 10-year-old girl, so they can help with the chores. <laughs> and so it's a totally open source design if you, if you want it, OK? So, right, okay. So I haven't figured out a way professionally to have impact on that. But in those uh, uh, chicken tractors, we raised the most expensive uh, chickens in the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, on to batteries. Right. So batteries. So the first thing I want to say about batteries is that batteries are chemical devices. They're electrochemical devices. And so we're, we're bound by the periodic table. Right. And what's been true for a long time, continues to be true today, is that uh, we look for high energy density batteries to come from the top of the periodic table, light elements. Right? Those are the ones that will give us um, a high energy density per unit mass, also high energy density per unit volume, but more importantly per mass. Right? Are you showing the slides or do we have to take pictures? Uh, I think that it's going to be YouTube. I think the. the, the, the okay, yeah. Um, but uh, so these are, these are the common elements. And frankly, the problem is that the periodic, periodic table just isn't big enough. You know? uh, we don't have enough elements to work with. Right? And so to, to, to a real extent, we are actually constrained by what we can work with here. And in particular, you know, we speak of a working ion, the ion that, does the, that goes back and forth and is the, the ion that stores uh, charge. And we really only have that short list over there. And really, it's the top three. Right. So that's really all we have to work with. And lithium con uh, continues to be, in, from the point of view of energy density, uh, the, the preferred uh, ion for us. Right? We just simply can store more energy per mass or per volume when you use lithium today than any of the others. So the, uh, taking this in mind, I'm now going to say a little bit about uh, batteries for transportation and where, that's, uh, where that is and where that's headed. Right? And I'm going to do so with a couple of uh, plots like this that are intended to uh, make two points. Uh, first, you know, you know, I actually am going to skip over the part of you know, what is a battery. Okay, so I'm going to assume that um, uh, we all understand that everybody understands that batteries are, have uh, two electrodes, and we store charge in the form of ions in both electrodes. And a rechargeable battery has to go back and forth. 
Right, so that's what uh, we look for. And so each one on the left-hand side here, oh, I, I'm going to have to pause here and tell you that I was given the following guidance uh, in preparing for this talk. They said that this is a crowd that really wants to relive its MIT roots of drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> and that if I don't you know, meet that bar, the talk will be a complete failure. <laughs> so um, you can tell me at the end, at the end if I've uh, succeeded. So. Um, this is the theoretical energy density, and the main point is that these are all very high. And so you can uh, ask, well, how high is high? This is kilowatt hours of energy per kilogram of material right, that it'll store. And you see that you know, there's, all these, there's a whole bunch of alphabet soup acronyms here, and they all refer to specific chemistries of uh, compounds used as electrodes and batteries. So lithium is pretty straightforward. GR is graphite. Now, what's NMC333? That's nickel, manganese, cobalt, a mixture of that, uh, an oxide based on that. The 333 is the ratio of the three. Right? There's something called LMRNMC, and I, even, you know, I have to try to remember what that means. It actually means lithium and manganese rich NMC. Right? But, so these, but these are all names for compounds, and that's, that's, that really isn't the important part. But what you see is that you know, on this theoretical energy uh, plot, the four to the left, are what we're working towards in lithium ion batteries today. Right? That's what we use. And then you have two far out to the right. And theoretically, the energy density is fairly enormous. This is, let's say, 3,000 uh, watt hours per kilogram. And the, uh, NIS, uh, the Tesla Model S pack right now is close to about 150 watt hours per kilogram. So 3,000 to 150. Right? And so, uh, there's a there's really large gap between theoretically what chemistry can do and practically what we get out of it, right? and there are a lot of reasons for that. And uh, so, but what I want to do with this middle plot here is to show you if that's where we are today, the open bubble down there, uh, where do we think we're going? And the main point here is that in the lithium ion world, people are always asking, is lithium ion reaching the end of its roadmap? There's still a long way to go. Right? We can still imagine going to perhaps three times the energy density if we really put into play all of the materials innovations that we think we can. Right? The horizontal axis is the watt hours uh, per mass. And the way this has worked is that, uh, well, you know, from a physics point of view of moving a car down the road, you know, watt hours, amount of energy per mass makes a whole lot of sense. But once you start designing a car, you realize that uh, the watt hours per volume is actually more important. We like to have room for passengers, for example, <laughs> and, and luggage. Right? And so uh, the industry today actually values the vertical axis more. Right? But what's happening is that with electric flight, we're gonna, I think we'll be back to valuing the horizontal axis more. Right? So these are the kinds of uh, things that we think about. Um, and uh, so, the, so the middle is lithium ion. And then the right is a you know, one uh, alternative chemistry. I'll just tell you, uh, try to illustrate why something like this might have higher uh, energy density than uh, lithium ion. Uh, but the, the main thing is that I want to ask you to keep in mind where the top of this is, two points. One is that the top of the, these charts are right around 500 watt hours per liter. Okay? Uh, and the horizontal axis well, it's around uh, maybe 350, 400 watt hours per kilogram. Right? I'll come back to those numbers later, for instance, when we talk about uh, electric flight. OK, lithium sulfur. You know, we think of lithium uh, ion batteries such as we would use in our, uh, we still use in our cell phones. Uh, we use, still use lithium cobalt oxide uh, as the primary uh, compound. The area under this curve, which is voltage versus capacity, which is char amount of charge per mass, milliamp hours per grams, uh, equivalent to coulombs per gram. Right? Amount of charging store per mass. The area under the curve is the amount of uh, energy it stores in, in terms of watt hours per mass. And you see that a lithium sulfur battery has five times the, that of a lithium ion battery. Why don't we all use lithium sulfur batteries? Right? So it turns out that we've been, you know, uh, uh, we've been trying for about 30 or 40 years to advance lithium sulfur batteries to where we can take advantage of something like this. Right? Looks great, right? Why wouldn't you do this? Right? And so just to point out one really practical issue, it turns out that in order to make that lithium sulfur battery work, we use a liquid electrolyte. And every time we charge a liquid electrolyte, part of that liquid electrolyte dries out and becomes a solid. And we cycle it until it's dry. And when it's dry, it dies. And unfortunately, it takes a very few number of cycles for that to take place. 
And so it turns out that how do you make a, a lithium sulfur battery last a long time? You give it a giant tank of electrolyte. <laughs> And you cycle and keep you know, eating up that electrolyte. And so that's not practical. And that's one of the reasons lithium sulfur isn't where it is, uh, theoretically. Right? Not even close. So um, those are kind of uh, 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 issues that we that deal with uh, when we try to design better batteries. The other thing I want to point out here is that at the top of both charts involves lithium metal. Okay. And uh, the lithium ion battery is famous because it does not use lithium metal. Right? It uses graphite that stores the lithium ions, but it does not actually have the metal in it intentionally. If you produce a lot of the metal, then you actually are uh, causing trouble. Right? So, um, but what we're, the reason these roadmaps end with lithium metal is because today, across the field, that's where our focus is once again, trying to make lithium metal uh, uh, successful. Right? And now, uh, and I'll tell you why it hasn't been so far. But first, if we look at what the U.S. Department of Energy has funded for transportation batteries, this is the Vehicle Technologies Office. They've grouped it, loosely speaking, into what is lithium ion, today's technology that does not use lithium metal. And then what you see is that on the right, they have a category called beyond lithium ion. There are seven technologies here. Those are the seven shots on goal that they've been funding. You know, Stanford, MIT, all across the country. Right? Many, many universities and national labs. Right? And what you notice is that out of those seven, six of them involve lithium metal. Right? And one of them does not involve a different metal, <laughs> magnesium metal. Right? And so the reason that this, using lithium metal is so important from the energy density point of view is that you can't do any better than having your working ion precipitate and form a solid uh, when it comes to the electrode. Right? You get rid of all the hosts that otherwise have to store that, lith that lithium ion. And so you see that th those, are, uh, those are the, um, uh, the ones that we focus on. And not only for energy density, this is actually a cost plot because the vertical axis is cost. And getting below a bar here of 100 watt hours per kilo, uh, $100 per kilowatt hour uh, it's a long-standing uh, goal of the uh, DOE. So they see that uh, these are the chemistries that can do it. Some of you saw this uh, just yesterday, right? Uh, so the Nobel Prize was given to uh, three individuals, uh, John Goodenough, uh, Stan Whittingham, and uh, Akira Yoshino. And the reason I show you this, so first, uh, you know, it's great that finally lithium-ion technology is recognized, right? And you might ask, how has it, why has it taken so long? We think it's taken a very long time. And in part, it's because, I think, because the advances took place, contr important contributions by different individuals over literally 30 years. Right? And so no one of them created a fully successful battery. Right? And so that probably uh, is one of the reasons why it's taken a long time to uh, reach this level of recognition. John Goodenough is now 97 years old, is the oldest recipient of the Nobel Prize ever. Yeah. Uh, and so Stan Whittingham is, now what Stan did back in the very early 70s at um, um, uh, uh, Exxon, uh, New Jersey, uh, was that he created a battery much like what I uh, showed uh, earlier, which is a lithium metal electrode against a cathode which at that time was titanium disulfide. So that battery demonstrated that you could use lithium, and secondly, that you could use a compound called an intercalation compound as a cathode. But what didn't work uh, was that the lithium metal electrode uh, did not actually function well for long enough and safely enough. Exxon uh, did not commercialize that technology. The company that did, called Mali Energy, uh, uh, essentially went out of business because they were the first to market with a battery that used lithium metal. And the problem with lithium metal was that it formed something called a dendrite, right, which had the, this uh, unfortunate uh, behavior of ca causing an internal short circuit, which combined with a flammable liquid uh, solvent, uh, you know, the, the you know, <laughs> expected uh, happened. Right? So that was this great, you know, this example of the first to market gets crushed. <laughs> Okay. And so the innovation that is the lithium ion battery was actually uh, what Stan demonstrated, but without, the, uh, with, uh, but without the lithium metal. 
And so uh, Yoshino-san, uh, his you know, contribution to this was recognizing that carbon right, was a, an ideal host to insert that lithium into so that you didn't actually get the metal itself. You know? so, the, so a battery, a lithium metal battery is an electroplating machine. Every time we charge and discharge it, we plate lithium metal. Right? And so what he did was to show that you could use graphite and not actually get the metal. Right? So uh, w the irony of all this is that uh, what Stan Whittingham did, uh, ran into this obvious barrier with lithium metal. Uh, in the interim, uh, lithium ion was created. John Goodenough's uh, contribution, uh, amongst many, was to come up with that lithium cobalt oxide that I showed you earlier. Right? But here in 2019, we're back to lithium metal again. Right? So I wrote my uh, first uh, research proposal asking a DOE for funding to work on, a lithium, on the lithium metal electrode back in the fall of 2016. And so many of you remember what was going on in the fall of 2016. And so I asked my program manager, you know, if I title this proposal, let's make lithium metal great again, <laughs> would that help me get funded? <laughs> so, so that's when I got back to this game. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. So the, you know, how do you make lithium metal? So I, I hope I, you know, I've made the case, uh, I, I've been trying to make the case that lithium metal is where the, near, uh, the, the, the next 10 years, uh, for folks like us, we want to see lithium metal in a, in a real commercialized battery, right? a rechargeable battery. And so uh, one of the ways, there are a number of ways to, to do this. Uh, you can do it with a liquid electrolyte. You can do it with uh, you know, a, a clever design, clever architecture. You can uh, coat the lithium metal. You can, there are a lot of different approaches that are being tried by you know, a lot of researchers. But one of the general areas that's gotten a lot of attention is to make the battery all solid state. Now, we like solid state electronic devices. Why do we have batteries that use liquid electrolytes? Why don't we all just use solid state batteries? That would make life so much easier. Right? And so uh, you see these uh, news clippings. And so over the last few years, there's been a lot of focus on solid state electrolytes. And in particular, in conjunction with lithium metal. Right? So what are solid state electrolytes? These are ceramic compounds right? that uh, happen to be able to transport lithium ions at a fairly high rate. And over the last decade, what was discovered were some new ceramic compounds in which the uh, conductivity of those lithium ions was just as high as it is in a liquid electrolyte. So you have a solid that conducts lithium just as fast as a liquid electrolyte. Solids have an advantage at low temperature. Liquid ele electrolytes often freeze, and then when they freeze, the conductivity drops off. Solid electrolytes, they're already frozen. Right, so it's not going to happen again, right? Okay, so that's why at low temperature you see the green curve nose dives downward. That's a, a liquid electrolyte, and the uh, the solid state you know, just continues. Right? So and the problem was uh, so it was perceived that we might be able to solve this uh, lithium dendrite problem with the uh, using a solid because if you have a hard solid, lithium metal. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if any of you have ever actually handled lithium metal. So first of all, it's very low density. It's you know, half a gram per cc. It's half the density of water. And you throw it on water, it floats. And then it blows up. Right? <laughs> we all know that, right? But first it floats. Right? Then it blows up. Right? Okay. But the other thing about lithium metal is that this, it's, it's like taffy. You know? it's, it's very soft. And so the idea that a soft, electro, a, a soft metal against a hard ceramic electrolyte will be a very stable construction, that's the, that was the idea and the hope. Right? I'm going to show you that that turns out not to be true. Right? And so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, where we're at today. So first of all, just if you look at the volumes of each of these three pictures, the middle, let's call that uh, conventional lithium ion. Uh, whenever someone tells me about a new solid state battery, the first question I ask and the first question you should ask is, did it enable a metal electrode? Because if it didn't, you don't actually gain any energy density. That's what's on the right. And you almost certainly have a battery that costs you more. Okay? You really have to use that metal so you can shrink the whole volume and mass of the whole device. Right? So that's, that's the first thing. So it, just because it's a solid state battery, you're not going to gain unless you enable the metal. Right? And so here's the big surprise. Lithium metal actually, when you deposit it, penetrates uh, these hard ceramic electrolytes. Like when they have the hardness of window glass right? uh, very easily. And so you know, what's going on here? This is our big surprise in, in looking at this. And one analogy to it is, you know, water is, is fluid, but you know that the freeze-thaw cycle, water is extremely damaging. Right? 
And so we can think of what happens to these ceramic electrolytes as being analogous to that. The only difference is that we're electrodepositing this metal. But it is, despite its softness, it's able to generate great pressure that actually fractures hard ceramics. Right? And so uh, here's a couple of examples. In each case, what we're doing is we're uh, the, the lithium, you can't see the ions, but they're coming through the solid. And it's plating lithium metal, and what you see is that you have this metal that's growing into the solid. That's what these uh, pictures are showing you. And so even when you take the most perfect uh, uh, single crystal, you know, so what's the most perfect uh, solid electrolyte you can imagine? Let's get a single crystal. Very expensive. We'll never <laughs> and so we go and grow a single crystal. We polish it. It's the most perfect solid electrolyte you can imagine. And that's that single crystal sitting right there. And then we take it and we make a, a cell and we uh, electrically drive lithium back and forth through it. And we plate lithium on the top surface. Right. What we see here, let's see if I can uh, get this, uh, make this play. I think it will. Let's see. Uh, well, maybe I need to do that. Oh, no. All right. Uh, you're going to have to use your imagination. Um, OK, so uh, if it were working, uh, what you would see, so in this case, with the positing lithium metal from the bottom up towards the top, with the, it says gold electrode. And what this video would show you is that you see lithium metal growing up through the single crystal. And eventually, at the bottom, you see the electrical short occur. Right? OK, so uh, why does it do this? So it turns out that these surfaces of solid electrolytes, where the lithium metal meets this uh, solid, it's always defective to some extent. Right? So if you think of it as having flaws, like I show you here, this is very much like how brittle materials fail. They fail because of the surface flaws, not the bulk properties. So you have uh, surface flaws that are the initiators, the sites that where defects propagate from. And what happens in this electroplating process is that we first fill those surface flaws. Right. And then what you have is a metal asperity, which to all the electrical engineers in the, uh, in the audience will look a lot like a field emitter. Right. And so we are depositing a lithium metal at a asperity that's like a field emitter. And so that's where the metal deposits first. Right. When you consider the, what, can, you know, what has to happen here as you deposit this metal is that you have to have, uh, there has to be a volume expansion to accommodate the metal. And, so that metal can either open the crack and, dry, and allow the dendrite to go forward, or it has to be extruded or, you know, or uh, forced out the back side of the crack. Right, so in this picture up top here, the metal, uh, you know, what's going to happen is that the metal will deposit where that red arrow is. Right? And either it has enough uh, time and low enough, let's call it viscosity, so that it can flow out, or it's going to open the crack. Right? And so, uh, and then that's all, that behavior is all compounded by the fact that anytime you have an edge, and this, you, know, you have this continuity in a metal electrode, you also get a field concentration. Right? So these two effects combined are really what prevents these, uh, the, uh, this, uh, these lithium, solid state lithium uh, metal based batteries from working today. Right? So um, the, we, uh, we are making some progress on this. And so, you know, what is uh, to, to, to someone like, you know, folks like us, you know, what is the, you know, what is uh, the, what is, a, what is success? It turns out that because of the phenomenon that I just showed you, there's only a limited current density that we can run through these batteries before the metal uh, dendrite forms and causes internal short circuit. Today, that current density is too low on the vertical axis here. Right? These are units of milliamps per centimeter squared. This is the current through the battery, current density through the battery. And it turns out that for a range of solid electrolytes, it's all below one. A practical battery has to be at least three. Right? And so we have figured out a, a, a approach to getting around this problem, uh, which is the mysterious recent MIT result. Okay. Right. Now, uh, we have a few more experiments to do. But if this is successful, then you, you'll read about it. <laughs> right? And I think that this will be a significant step towards actually enabling a solid state lithium metal based battery. Okay? So this is, this is how I get my kicks as a material scientist. Work on this. All right, I'm going to have to really move here. Uh, okay, let's talk about electric flight. We're interested in electric transportation in all its forms. 
And so there's a lot going on in electric aviation uh, today, right? And so based on, uh, take, take what I just uh, talked about and say, you know, you can ask the question, uh, what is required going from electric vehicles today to electric airplanes? I have a colleague at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Venkat uh, Viswanathan. And uh, so he's, he knows actually much more about batteries and electric flight than I do. So I'm going to crib a couple of his slides. Right? So, but you know, he's really done a deep dive on this. I'm going to share a couple of things. that. Uh, and so this is Venkat's recent paper from last year. It turns out that the most kind of out-of-the-box type of vehicle, which is the you know, vertical takeoff and landing uh, uh, electric uh, vehicle, uh, which is a lot like a drone, uh, is actually, from the point of view of the battery, uh, the, the, the closest. Right? So it turns out that this, uh, so if you take this, uh, you know, here, here are a couple of uh, military versions, but uh, if you imagine, you know, like Uber Elevate, you know, something, a, a, a passenger uh, air vehicle that takes off, cruises, and lands, it turns out that the most challenging parts of that flight cycle are the two green parts, the steep parts at the beginning and the end. The vertical axis is the power that you need. Right? So uh, that's where the, the battery has to discharge at a very high rate. And if you look at the time axis, it has to discharge at a very high rate for much longer than any reasonable person can stand on the accelerator of a car. Okay, uh, You just don't stand on the gas for that long. <laughs> but when you're flying this vehicle, you do. So it turns out that taking off and then landing. Landing is just as strenuous on the battery as taking off. Right? So in the middle, the power you need for a cruise is relatively modest. And then there's this other part that we have to keep in mind is that in order to fly, you have to have a very significant reserve power or reserve energy left, and that's the green part. Right? So if you look at that, and this is the flight cycle for a, uh, a VTOL. Oh, there's the VTOL, the vertical takeoff and landing cruise, and, <laughs> right? Right. and uh, that's the landing part. Uh, OK, that green part is what I just showed you. Right? And then on the bottom here, that flight cycle is compared to a couple of other, uh, what we would call you know, uh, fairly challenging uh, applications today, electric vehicle, electric semi-truck. Right? And what you see is that the takeoff and landing is where the power has to exceed uh, what you see in the, uh, uh, in the ground vehicles. Right? So it, for us, it boils down to a fairly uh, straightforward problem. We have to learn how to deliver high energy density, but also high discharge power for long durations, right, compared to long durations. And so uh, how far away is it? This is a plot that uh, you know, uh, my friend Venkat compiled. And each one of those dots represents a commercial lithium ion battery today. The horizontal axis is the specific energy, watt hours per kilogram. What's in the circle there is the requirement for, to get started, the minimum requirement for EV toll. And honestly, we look at that and say, that, that isn't that hard. <laughs> we should be able to do that with some you know, continued work. Right? And so that's uh, uh, you know, another 10% increase in specific energy over the best we can do today. But it is three times the power. Right? So, and so we have to figure out how to get the lithium ion out of the electrodes and across that battery faster than we can today uh, while still maintaining that energy density. Uh, this is Venkat himself. We have a project just started, uh, funded by Aurora Flight Sciences, which is looking at different ways of doing that. And one of the ways to, of doing that is to create uh, battery electrodes with an internal structure that's really designed for transport, with, high, with uh, essentially uh, uh, lanes, you know, high-speed lanes for lithium ions. So that's, for, um, that's for electric, uh, electric flight uh, for VTOLs. Here's uh, electric flight for the rest of the uh, airplane fleet. Right. Uh, this is a paper that uh, is not yet out, uh, but what you see here is you know, across a number of uh, vehicle types and flight cycles, a regional jet requires a specific energy here of about uh, 650 uh, watt hours per kilogram. Right. Narrow body, uh, wide body, and pretty soon we're over 1,000 watt hours per kilogram. Right. This is the most ambitious uh, electric vehicle battery project in, in, in the U.S. today. Uh, battery 500, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, numerous national labs. What you see here is that this is considered an ambitious proje uh, project for electric vehicles, and it just barely gets to what we can do with uh, 
with uh, a, a conventional airplane. So this is the gap that we're facing. If people ask me, hey, can you fly across the, uh, you know, do intercontinental flight with a wide body airplane? Well, you need about 12, 1,200 watt hours per kilogram. And this is where you say, you know, uh, batteries cannot solve all of society's problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the most important ones. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Um, uh, how's my time? All right, okay, I'm uh, concerned. Uh, Half an hour, oh, okay, good. All right, I'm now gonna switch over to the grid, uh, the other area, and uh, talk about batteries for uh, electrical, uh, electrical storage uh, for our electricity system. And I borrowed this slide from uh, Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance. And uh, the little circle there is what batteries are in the context of the energy ecosystem today. Right? Storage is actually much larger and, but that's all pumped hydroelectric storage. Right? That's over 95% of the storage we have today. Batteries are a tiny little bit. Right? Um, so, um, but if we look at what's going on in electricity generation, this is all public data from the EIA, uh, 2000 to uh, roughly today, uh, what we see is that you know, coal is declining. Yeah? Coal is on its way out. Uh, we can help give it a little shove, but it's you know it's going no matter you know with or without us, right? Um, and there's only two curves here that are increasing a positive slope. One is natural gas, and the other is renewables. And natural gas is a factor of five uh, uh, above renewables here. Right? You can look at this slide, and as you see here, uh, you can come to the conclusion that natural gas wins, right? uh, unless uh, we come up with breakthrough storage that enable, allows renewables to beat natural gas. Right? Uh, so this is at least one way to simplify the problem. And, and, uh, you know, I like this one because it allows us to think about the problem in a simple way. Beat natural gas. Right? Right? So, like beat LA. Right? <laughs> beat natural gas. Right? Okay? Uh, so uh, now with that kind of clarity, uh, this allows us to then look at the problem and say, you know, uh, what, well, what would it really take? Right? So I want to spend a, a few minutes trying to you know, uh, elaborate on what a breakthrough in energy storage should actually look like. What is it that we need? Right? If you look at lithium ion decreasing in price so dramatically um, over the last decade or so, and you look at how, lith uh, how batteries are being deployed in utility scale um, projects. So this on the right is you know, year by year uh, and is only utility storage. And what you see is that the blue bar gets uh, bigger and bigger. Right? So it would appear as if it's all lithium ion. Right? And so then the question is, you know, again, you know, a common question. Can we do it all with lithium ion? And there are a lot of uh, pieces to that question. Um, the, what lithium ion really excels at is a storage up to a few hours. Right. And so, you know, the one on a uh, duck curve problem is a few hours of storage. Right. And so this, you know, uh, really, uh, I believe that this can, be, uh, uh, this can be satisfied with lithium ion, especially as the cost continues to come down. And so uh, this is a Laurel Mountain. Uh, you see a lithium ion battery farm at the time in 2011. It was the you know, largest lithium ion battery farm in the world. This used A123 batteries. And it was to uh, uh, accomplish this kind of ramping for the windmills that you see in the back. Right? So, but uh, um, if, you, if all we have is 100% you know, predictable you know, daily uh, the diurnal uh, solar cycle, uh, no cloudy days, you know, then uh, this could be all we ever need. Right? But you know, it turns out that the world is more complicated than that, as I'm uh, uh, sure you, you all recognize. And so uh, how do we look at uh, how, you know, how, what kind of storage we need? And so this is, uh, you know, Albert said, uh, you know, use data. Okay, all right, I'm gonna show you uh, how we think about this problem. Uh, this, so what is this plot? The vertical axis on a log scale is how much the battery cost us. The horizontal axis is how often we use the battery, okay? The, dia the diagonal lines here is the cost of electricity delivered from that storage system, as if you were just getting electricity through your meter. Okay? So the bottom is two cents a kilowatt hour. Okay? And so uh, 
what those lines show you is that if you pay a certain price for a battery, and then you use it a certain number of times a year, and it lasts you 20 years, right, that then determines the utilization of the battery and how much that electricity costs you. Okay? All right. So this is one way to look at how much uh, a battery has to cost in a certain application. Right. OK, um, let's see. This horizontal axis is a great oversimplification because we don't actually use batteries simply by charging and discharging them. Uh, their duty cycles are actually very complex. Right? So if we then map onto this, that chart that I just showed you, what batteries we have today uh, can do, uh, the lithium ion battery sits in that band at the top. Yeah? The cost at grid scale, I think, is unlikely to get much below about $100 a kilowatt hour. Okay? And then we have some other technologies that are coming along that are these other curves. VFRB is a vanadium redox flow battery. There are uh, so, some, future, some other chemistries that are being designed for flow batteries. And then also shown on this plot is where PHS, pump hydroelectric storages, we have a lot of, lot of that in the world today. Compressed air, that's underground compressed air energy storage. We don't have a lot of that in the world today, but we can you know, design it. And what you see is that up to a certain uh, cycling rate, a certain u uh, utilization, uh, we have technologies that might work. Right? But beyond, so once we get to a few days and beyond, weekly and beyond in this uh, case, uh, we don't really have a technology. Right? And so that's, that's where there is a gap. And so then the, question, you know, then the question people often ask is, well, do you really need longer duration storage? Right? So, and how long a duration do you need? And so do we need a technology there? Right? So we looked into that with, a, uh, with an academic study that's now published uh, for which there is also a commercial version uh, that, which uses proprietary information that isn't published. But what we did was to say, if we take the current generation methods for electricity, uh, at the bottom here uh, is baseload electricity, which is 24-7 continuous output of electricity. Right? And then there's a, 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 what's called intermediate generation, where it's in roughly four-hour blocks or so. And then there's something called peakers. And everybody, I think, knows what uh, peakers are. And you turn them on, and the typical uh, operating cycle is about four hours. Okay? Now, so the question would be, if, if we looked at these kind of generation profiles, and we used wind and solar as the source of the electricity, and we use storage as the way to smooth it out over those uh, durations. Uh, how does that all work out? Right? And what is it that we actually need? Right? So uh, first of all, the study that we did that's published uses the simplest possible uh, waveform for the actual output of these power plants. You know, baseload is not exactly flat. Right? And peakers aren't exactly a square wave. Right? But that's how, in this case, we, we modeled it. Right? And so uh, we did the following. This is a study that I did with a uh, colleague at MIT, Jessica Transic. Uh, this is the wind belt. So I'll give you an illustration. We looked at both wind and solar. Uh, but you see in the middle of the US, uh, the wind belt there. And so we can pick off a couple of uh, places that have uh, you know, very good winds, such as you know, Iowa in this case. And we can get the generation from that site uh, from the last 20 years. And then we can uh, make the assumption that the next 20 years will look like the last 20 years. And then we say, let's say we have the ability to uh, build more wind at a cost and to build storage at a cost. And then we're going to look at the two and change the relative amounts of more generation, you know, over generation, and storage and figure out what gives us the lowest cost of electricity all in. Right? And so what is, the, what is the combination of generation storage that minimizes the LCOE, levelized cost of electricity? out of that combined system. Right? And we can do it with uh, different price batteries. Right? The, uh, expensive, uh, uh, a big cheap battery will use the battery more. Uh, a small expensive battery will, will have uh, more generation. Okay. okay, so the results look something like this. The color coding that you see here is the levelized cost of electricity. And so at, down to the bottom, it's 5 cents a kilowatt hour. I don't know what it actually is here in the Bay Area, but you know, for us, it's around. Uh, but right now, you don't get any, right? <laughs> uh, so you know, in New England, it's about 10 cents, 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. So, uh, so the first thing is that this combination of renewable generation, in this case, wind and batteries, we want it to be in the blue. In the darker the blue, the better. Okay. 
There we're competing with natural gas. Beat natural gas. Right? Okay. As it goes towards the red, that's now uh, very expensive. The horizontal axis is how much the energy storage system costs us in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour. The vertical axis is how much it costs us in terms of dollars per kilowatt power. But you'll see that these are very steep, so let's just ignore that. Right? It's not very sensitive to that. The real question that we're trying to answer here is how cheap does the battery system have to be in order for wind plus storage to give us a levelized cost of electricity that beats natural gas? The simple answer is less than about $30 a kilowatt hour. Right? Okay, so less than about $30 a kilowatt hour. Lithium ion, we think uh, the floor might be around 100. Right? And there's another fact, a feature here, which is that the slopes correspond to how long you have to store that energy for, kind of you know, on an average out. And it says about 100 hours, it's about four days. Right? And so in this particular scenario, four days of storage, less than $30 a kilowatt hour. We don't have a solution for that today. Right. Okay. So, so trying to simplify, you know, th 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 there's endless complexity in this paper. You can go read it. <laughs> right. But this is one's a simple conclusion. Okay. Oops, I missed that part. Thirty dollars a kilowatt hour. And how would you actually use this battery? What does the battery actually do? This chart is the state of charge of the battery. At the top, the battery is fully charged. At the bottom is fully depleted. This is 20 years of operation of that battery. Right. And you can see that depending on whether it's solar, wind, or a mix of the two, uh, the qualitatively, uh, the common features are that you build a very large, very cheap battery to cover periods of deep loss in, in renewable generation. They don't last very long. They last you know, a few days at a time. Uh, but you, you get nothing during those periods. And that's really what you're designing the battery to do. This is if you want to supply the kind of uh, reliability of electricity that we're all used to, in this case, 100%. Right? The answer doesn't change very much for 99%, 98%. 50%, the problem's a lot easier to solve, but you know, we're not happy with 50% reliability. Right? Okay. okay, so uh, this led us to the question of what, could you, what kind of battery can give you that kind of low cost at, uh, you know, uh, and that kind of long duration. And coming back to the chemistry, um, uh, a plot, this is the last 100 years of battery chemistry, all in one plot, a, uh, you know, by the year that it you know, came, you know, came into existence. And the vertical plot is a log scale of the cost of the, of the chemistry. Right? And so this is just the cost of the chemicals. We haven't built the battery yet. It's just the cost of the chemicals. Right? And you notice that it's a band that moves upwards on a log plot over the last 100 years, right? or at least the last 50. And so the, you know, the, the, the right question for all of you to ask is, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you and all your friends who are battery electrochemists doing? <laughs> so what we are doing is trying to give you high energy density for your electric vehicle. <laughs> okay, that's the reason for this. So uh, what we, and so this is where that wind to base electricity band was. And so this is a filter. Nothing above it is going to work because the chemicals cost us too much, and we haven't even built the battery yet. Right? And so, uh, well, what are the, what are the ones that uh, fall below? And, well, it turns out that sodium and sulfur are tremendously abundant uh, you know, the elements in the Earth's crust. And they also have a, a high energy density. So you can, you know, the energy density, the dollars per kilowatt hour of energy is high. And so you know, we tend to focus, uh, so you, know, you can do, use it as a filter, and this is what we did. We said, okay, what we want is sodium and sulfur. But what we want is not a sodium sulfur battery of the type that, you, that has existed up until now, which is a high temperature battery, right? molten sodium, molten sulfur. Right? We want an ambient temperature battery. And so that's uh, the, the work that we did uh, in this particular case. Um, this is uh, Sam, Liang, and uh, Li. Uh, the gang of three, as I call them. Uh, and so we came up with a battery that uses sulfur as an ultra low cost uh, ingredient. And then the other electrode is the cheapest electrode we could find, which is air. Right? So sulfur, air. And so that created this very low cost combination. Um, this is what led to the founding of uh, form energy. Right? Uh, this, uh, this work that caused us to you know, realize that there might be a technical solution to this. Um, 
That picture, I have to point out, was taken uh, Christmas Eve of uh, 2016, right? 2016, yeah. And uh, these guys are in the lab getting data. And we have this picture. And so, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, I could have had them over. It's Christmas Eve. <laughs> Instead, they were in the lab getting data. Right? But happily doing so. <laughs> and so, uh, this, uh, so the reason that uh, this particular uh, battery of electrochemistry was so interesting to us, if you look at not only the cost, but the abundance of sulfur. On the right-hand side here, this is Saudi Arabia, the berry uh, uh, gas plant. And that giant uh, yellow pile there is all sulfur. That sulfur pile alone is equivalent to 1.2 terawatt hours of battery storage. Right? The global sulfur resource is 25 terawatt hours of uh, battery storage in this particular form. Okay? And so that completely dwarfs even pumped hydro today. And so at least here is uh, one approach that would, uh, uh, could conceivably get there. So uh, Form Energy is this company that is now two years old, and uh, we just raised the, uh, a second round. And so I want to just tell you, you know, who, it is, who do we rope together to work on this problem? Very low cost, long duration storage. We have Matteo Jaramillo, who uh, was at Tesla until the end of 2016. And he was uh, director of drivetrains at one point, and then uh, later head of Tesla Energy. Right. Um, and uh, Ted Wiley, uh, he's uh, our president. And uh, he started Acreon, another uh, battery company. Uh, Marco Ferreira, the guy over the, uh, on the right, it says SVB, SVP, but his other title is CIO, which stands for uh, Chief Italian Officer. Yeah. Right? Okay? <laughs> and uh, if you know Marco, you know ex exactly what I mean. Right? But what he does is something e enormously valuable for us, which is data analytics. So I showed you an academic study of figuring out you know, what kind of battery to design for what kind of application. So I want you to imagine the commercial version of doing this. We get a uh, actual uh, a power producer who, for example, has a coal plant that they're trying to phase out. And the question might be, given the wind that we have in that region and the, the, wind, uh, uh, the wind plant that's already there, what kind of storage combined with that wind plant would allow you to replace that, uh, allow you to phase out that coal plant? Right? And so what you need to do that is that you need to know all the economics of that coal plant. Right? And you need to know exactly what is the output profile today. Right? And so that's the kind of exercise that we go through with that uh, uh, Marco uh, leads for us. Uh, Billy Woodford, the young guy in the middle in the back there, uh, is an amazing uh, uh, young CTO. And so this is, uh, this is uh, how we're uh, going after this problem. Uh, if you read the article that just came out in Technology Review uh, that mentions form uh, today, it says that we're working on multiple chemistries, right? And so I just want to say that, you know, uh, sulfur is great, and we're spending a lot of time on sulfur, but there are, it turned out that that plot I showed you, uh, I actually missed a couple right, down on the low end. And so there are a couple of others that we're looking at as well down that, that could be super low cost. So, okay, let me just summarize this part, and then I want to spend a little bit of, just a little bit of time on uh, the other topic. So I said, you know, the future of energy storage. What, you know, what is... Um, you know, one person's view of the future of energy storage. You know, I think this metal, the, the, the metal electrode is going to, it will extend the lithium-ion roadmap. Uh, and so, you know, we will, I, I believe we will have rechargeable batteries based on lithium metal within, say, five years or so, right? And they'll start in some relatively short life applications, right? uh, When it comes to electric aviation, uh, you know, I think that uh, we can at least allow those who are thinking about how to implement uh, EV toll. Uh, to have some assurance that with continued work, we can give them a battery that can get them, quote, off the ground, right? Okay, <laughs> commercial air, <laughs> literally, too. <laughs> um, uh, commercial air transport, much more challenging, okay? We haven't, re and you know there's others, we haven't really thought about shipping, right? Shipping is another uh, uh, a big uh, 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 problem. Uh, for the grid, up to about 10 hours, you know, uh, if, if that's the space you're playing in, uh, I would be very concerned about whether lithium ion is continuing to cost down, uh, will be, end up being uh, forever the technology to beat. Right? But uh, for the longer duration applications, there, you know, we haven't had technologies, and that's where we can tap into some of these uh, newer chemistries. So with that, let me talk about a couple of other topics. Right? So the entire world isn't all batteries, even uh, for an electrochemist. Um, and 
I've been trying to get out of this battery field. I can't. <laughs> but I started working on a couple of other things. Right? Uh, I wanted to, so go back to that pie chart I showed you at the beginning. I want to talk about two, uh, two quote, you know, recent topics. Um, one on the right is related to cement. Okay? The one on the, sorry, that's the, that's the left. That's the, left. <laughs> <laughs> the one on the right, the one that says Google under it, uh, is a project in cold fusion. Right. Um, so I'm going to talk about these in order. And our project in cement is asking the question, is there a way to use low-cost renewable electricity to produce cement? Right. The way we do it today is primarily with coal. Right. Uh, I have to credit Dave Danielson for kind of inspiring me and pushing me to, to, to spend time on this problem over a couple of years. These are the cast of characters who worked on it. Leia is a postdoc on the, uh, the, the one uh, shown on the left here, uh, is the, I would call her the project leader, who's really pushed this forward, and uh, is uh, one, someone, she intends to continue taking this forward. Um, and I wanted to start with explaining this problem. What is the problem we're trying to solve? And give you three uh, simple numbers. The first is that, each kilogram of cement that we produce releases one kilogram of CO2. Right, so that's an easy calculation. The second is that we produce four billion tons of cement per year. Right? And that's going to continue to increase. Right? And the third is its uh, absurdly low selling price is what makes it so difficult to disrupt. You have this absolutely giant industry with an absolutely commoditized product, and that is by far the hardest thing to disrupt. Right? But the need to disrupt it is in that CO2 number. Right? So uh, we started thinking about this. And uh, so you know, just a, a, a brief description of you know, what is cement. This is our new building. This is MIT Nano. This is this beautiful limestone that they use. And you know, Vladimir Bulovic. Uh, at one level should be ashamed of himself. He got all this limestone from a quarry in southwest China, giant carbon footprint, right, to come to Cambridge, Massachusetts. But this is what we have in mind when we make cement, right, is that this is limestone. Cement starts off as limestone, and we turn it into cement, and then uh, over time it turns back into limestone. Right? Okay, that's the, that's the cement process. Right? Um, the difference between concrete and cement. Concrete is the stuff with the gravel in it. Cement is the stuff that doesn't yet have the gravel in it. Right? So the gray paste that you see, that's the cement. Right? Ordinary Portland cement. And so the way we make it today is that we start with limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and we turn it into lime, and we cook off the CO2. Right? Chemical CO2 that comes right off the calcium carbonate. We mix it with clay, uh, clay minerals, uh, silica, and we produce a calcium silicate. And in doing this whole process, you know, it turns out that about half of the CO2 we release comes from the calcium carbonate itself, cement. Uh, the other half comes from the uh, fuel that we use for the two parts of it. Right? The first part, calcining. The second part, uh, higher temperature heat treatment. Right? So in order to really solve this problem, you want to be able to attack all three of these. You want to do something about that chemical CO2 and do something about the fuel that we use to heat it. Okay? So... Um, the rate at which cement is being um, produced in the world right, is equivalent to one New York City every 30 days, right, projected to continue for the next 40 years. Right. So, giant problem. So, uh, how are people tackling this today? So, you know, it hasn't escaped uh, notice. And uh, I generally classify the approaches that are underway as uh, either alternative cements in which you try to capture CO2 in the cement itself, trap more CO2, that's taking it back to its ground state faster, accelerating that, uh, uh, for bringing it back to its ground state. And uh, the other is capturing the CO2 from the, uh, that, that evolved from the flue gas, and that's what the center wind generates. Right? None of these approaches use electrochemistry, except for cholera, which is up in the upper left. Their goal is also to make beneficial use of the CO2 and put more CO2 in the, in the process, and they do so through electrochemical process. So uh, you know, what, we were, what, what we wanted to do was to see, can we make Portland cement? 
instead of trying to give someone a new cement, right, give them just the cement that they're used to, can we, can we do that and use low-cost renewable electricity because of this, you know, this rising tide of very low-cost electricity from a renewable generation? And so uh, it turns out that the method that we are focused on right now in chemical terms is really very simple. Right? What this gift shows you is an electrolyzer, which probably, I mean, probably almost everybody in this uh, room built one of in, say, high school. Right? And you know, out of the right side is hydrogen coming off, and the left side is oxygen. Uh, and what's been put in this, uh, this is just a neutral water solution with some salt in it. But what is giving you the color is a pH indicator. So when you built that electrolyzer in high school, middle school, uh, they told you that hydrogen and oxygen come off. They probably didn't tell you that at the same time, one side gets very acidic, the other side gets very basic. But that's what happens. Right? And that's the part we're taking, we want to take advantage of here. So, uh, the pH scale is the bottom. The right is very basic. The right, the left is uh, very acidic. Right? Why is that useful? I'm going to remind you of another experiment you did in middle school. <laughs> so, which is that you took vinegar, and you put baking soda in it, and it went foam, and what came off was CO2. Right? So, sodium carbonate and also calcium carbonate, when put in an acidic solution, will release pure CO2. Right? So we have a reactor here. Now think of it as a reactor. We have an electrolyzer, hydrogen, oxygen. And so what happens here is that this side is the acidic side. You see you know, H plus, protons being released. That side's the basic side, OH minus. Left to its own devices, the two just recombine and form water in the middle. But we're going to keep them from doing that. Okay? What we're going to do instead is to uh, dribble in calcium carbonate on this side. Okay? And it's going to dissolve. It's going to release CO2, just like your middle school chemistry experiment. That CO2 is now pure CO2 mixed with pure oxygen. Right? Those, that mixture we can deal with because it's easy to separate. Right? This releases calcium into solution. And then from the right, we have a, a highly basic solution. And so calcium and OH together form calcium hydroxide. Right? That's a white precipitate. So you imagine as this takes place, imagine a snow globe. And we're precipitating out is calcium hydroxide. Right? So this is what's going on in this case. And now uh, there's calcium carbonate over here, a very simple reactor on a bench top. And so you see that uh, the yellow part is the middle pH. And so while that's taking place, we're precipitating calcium hydroxide. And it looks something like this white deposit you see on the right, okay? say on the left. Right? This calcium hydroxide is a, is, a, uh, is a precursor to cement. So instead of using calcium carbonate, we now use the calcium hydroxide because when that decomposes, it only releases water. Okay. And so we produce calcium hydroxide here, and it comes in all these different morphologies. And we can do so with, it turns out, very high efficiency that, you know, in terms of uh, uh, every electron that we put into the electrolyzer produces a certain amount of converted uh, calcium carbonate. Okay. And so this is what we call the Coulombic efficiency of device. And uh, so um, the overall reaction is we have calcium carbonate producing calcium hydroxide and releasing three gases. You know, we have CO2, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen, because it's electrolyzed at the same time. Okay? So what we've shown is that this material can now be used to make the active phase in ordinary Portland cement, OPC. Uh, when you hear ordinary Portland cement, the O is capitalized. It is not an adjective, it's a name. Right? It's a noun. It's a ordinary Portland cement is, is, uh, is, the, is the product. And so we've, got, we've done the first step in, in showing that this could be used in order to um, produce cement. And so uh, what's, what's the whole idea here? The idea is that if we have an electrolyzer-based process for making cement, uh, we can power renewable electricity, and we get off hydrogen and oxygen, which is, of course, also a fuel. And it turns out that that hydrogen and oxygen, if we were to simply combust it, would provide enough thermal uh, output to, heat, uh, to complete the rest of the process. So coincidentally, it turned, just 
it turns out that way. So we're envisioning. This is a long way. This is you know this is uh, this is uh, it says vision, not yet reality, not reality. It's vision. Right? And so, but the idea of using renewable electricity to now uh, both supply the fuel and to decarbonate the uh, the limestone. So this is our uh, cement project. Last one. All right, cold fusion. All right. Um, okay. On May 27th, 2019, Nature published our article, uh, A Perspective, Revisiting the Cold Case of Cold Fusion. Okay. And there were not one, not two, but three editorials that appeared in Nature that same day, yeah. different uh, journalists. And you know, uh, you know how those Brits are. They like to show these uh, pictures that look like you know, an old uh, movie, <laughs> a TV show. This is what fusion, cold fusion researchers looked like in 1989. And they reprinted that. Right? <laughs> That's Martin Fleischman. Right? And uh, the woman is actually a US congresswoman. Right? Uh, and at the bottom, this is what cold fusion researchers look like today. <laughs> <laughs> Courtesy of Matt Trevithick. <laughs> Matt sh shot this photo. And you know, we had to put this out just to show this is the new phase of cold fusion 30 years later. Okay. Right. So, um, so what's going on here? Right? What's going on? Uh, this was a project that was in stealth for uh, th three, now four years. So I just want to say, you know, uh, what did Google do in this case? So we couldn't, uh, no one in the United States, I, I was just flat out saying, no, uh, no researcher in the United States could write a government uh, agency a proposal to work on cold fusion and have any hope of getting it funded. Uh, no hope of ever getting it through peer review. Right? It took a different mechanism to make it safe to work on cold fusion again. Right? And that different mechanism was, in this case, uh, Google's support. Right? And so uh, you, you see what ha happened here is that you know, uh, none of us had any prior experience with uh, cold fusion. You saw the, the four groups that were shown there. Uh, had a sub substantial amount of funding over three years, but it was always with the idea of publishing everything that came out at the right time, and the right time was this past uh, spring. Right? To explain, uh, to, to, uh, to divulge what it is that we're doing. Right? And so, uh, you know, if you read that article, you know that it says that we have not found convinc convincing evidence. We have not found, not just say convincing, we have not, not found evidence for cold fusion yet. Right? OK? Uh, but we believe it's something that's worth uh, looking into. And so I'm telling you a story that does not yet have an ending here, because this is something that we're still doing. Right? And, but I, what I wanted to show you is, you know, what is it that you do? So how do, how, do you, how do you actually work on cold fusion? Let's say that you think cold fusion is a possibility. How do you work on it? What do you do? Right? Um, so in my case, it was actually you know, boiled down to a relatively simple materials problem. Right, which is why it was something that you know, uh, we felt we could make some progress with. And it has to do with getting a very high concentration of hydrogen in palladium so that there's the opportunity for cold fusion should it uh, be favorable. Right? And you know, the, the theoretical basis that would tell us exactly what we need to uh, achieve in terms of hydrogen concentration and, uh, and, and local structure is not yet known. Right? But all of the uh, evidence from prior work suggests that you at least have to get to very high hydrogen concentration. And this is where the electrochemistry comes in. Okay? So it turns out that electrochemically, oops, I think I missed this. I lost the slide here somewhere. Um, OK. I lost one slide. That's OK. Uh, so uh, palladium is in the middle. And what we do is that we electrochemically drive hydrogen into palladium. It turns out that the beauty of electrochemistry is that with a turn of a knob and fractions of a volt, you can apply a chemical potential, a thermodynamic uh, driving force that's equivalent to many, many gigapascals of applied pressure. Right? And so that's why we use electrochemistry. If we, were, we would have to build this giant pressure apparatus to do the same thing that we can do just by right? 100 millivolts or so. The problem, so we, it turned out that we can do that, but the problem is that hydrogen leaks out of palladium just as fast as you put it in. Right. Okay, so that turns out that, that that's, that's why you can't get this stuff loaded to a very high state. And so we have this problem of electrochemically pumping in hydrogen, easy, easy, leaking out very quickly. Right? And so uh, how do you stop the leak? 
and that essentially turns out to be the problem. And so uh, we built all this fancy instrumentation to figure out how to pump it in and how to figure out how fast it's coming out. Right? So uh, that's what all this represents. I won't go into detail. But what you see down here, these sandwiches in the middle, D, E, and F, these are all these uh, electrochemical cells in which we had one electrode driving in uh, uh, hydrogen into the, into the material. And in the middle is, uh, or the, the sample, uh, the sample's actually at the top is palladium. So what we found is that, well, we at least figured out why the bucket is so leaky. It turns out that palladium, when you insert hydrogen into it, expands tremendously. And it's a mechanical problem. Electrochemically, we cause fracture. And the surface, what you see on the left here, this is this, uh, on a piece of uh, electrolyte is a thin film of palladium. And you see all these eruptions. And locally, we're creating very high equivalent pressures, and it's actually blowing the material apart. Right? And so this, this is the problem that we uh, had to solve in, try, in order to try to maximize the uh, amount of hydrogen we can get into palladium. And so what we found is the best way to do it is to make the underlying substrate as soft as possible. Right? And it turned out that, so this plot is uh, showing you the vertical axis is how much hydrogen we got in. One is at the top, uh, is saturated. The horizontal axis is the voltage that we apply to the device, increasing as you go to the left. Okay. The lines there are the theoretical, th the thermodynamic uh, values that we would get. And so what we see here is in every case, we don't reach that line because the bucket is leaking. Right? But what we show is that we can get very close to the saturated value, 0.96. And uh, you know, we were able to uh, actually do this to very high precision. Right? So this was a small step right, on the way to really being able to evaluate, uh, to, to be, being able to study cold fusion. First, you have to be able to reliably make the materials in which uh, you do this. And uh, beyond this, there's a second step which is to now take this palladium uh, lattice and to jam even more hydrogen into it. And so uh, all, of you, uh, all of the MIT alumni here probably took either 3091 or 541. And uh, so you will all remember that in 3091, uh, you learned all about the rock salt crystal structure. Right? It turns out that that's palladium hydride. Right? It's a rock salt uh, compound here, palladium hydrogen. Uh, and that's what you see in, in, in the, uh, uh, the gray and red there. So it turns out that there's another phase, a tantalizing phase in which the, uh, the hydrogen or deuterium would be even closer together. Right? And that's the one that we're really interested in looking for uh, cold fusion in. And so our goal is boil down, you know, so my group, uh, our participation is boiled down to trying to make unusual states of palladium hydride in order to study the, light, the possibility of cold fusion. Right? And if we do that, you know, our reference experiment, what happens to the materials that we make? They go into this apparatus, which is at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, Thomas Schrenkel's uh, benchtop fusion apparatus. You know, it may surprise you that you can uh, produce uh, you know, fusion at will, deuterium, deuterium fusion at will on a benchtop. Uh, and in a lead line room, <laughs> but uh, 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 really very simply. Right? And so uh, this is the, the device into which we're uh, intending to put these unusual materials. And if we see some exciting, something exciting, you know, you'll read about it. Right? So um, I am probably over time. I'm going to stop there. And so uh, thank you for your attention. It's, uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Great. <laughs> So uh, fire, fire hose indeed. <laughs> I might take a nap after this, but I promised uh, some time for questions. So I'm going to open it up with two quick questions that were submitted online, and then we're going to have two runners uh, with some of the questions you might have here. So I'm just going to break it down to two of the top questions, one in business and one in technology, just to summarize. Uh, from a technology perspective, I think you covered a lot about the chemical batteries, but you didn't talk as much around like hydrogen generation, ammonia generation. Do you have a sense for if they will play a, a good role in this? Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, you know there uh, there are a lot of technologies I didn't talk about, and right. in fact, there are probably people in this audience who are practicing tech practicing technologies that I didn't talk about. So you know I, I you know I uh, I my 
general views. The first I say in general view is that uh, you know all of the above. We should really you know look at uh, all of them. The reason electrical chemistry is interesting to me is because it's uh, it, you know, it, even a lousy battery has much much higher energy density than, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, 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 pumped water, pumped rocks, uh, mechanical energy density. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons that. But your specific question is about hydrogen, right? Yeah. And uh, so um, it, when we, you know, one, of the, one of my plots actually did have hydrogen in it, mm -hmm. right? And so it's the cost of producing that hydrogen, right? And then there, of course, is the storage of hydrogen. So uh, hydrogen, you know, can hydrogen be an effective storage medium for long duration storage? Uh, technically, uh, I think absolutely it can. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to the economics of, okay. uh, of how you would do it. You have to be able to store it underground, mm -hmm. and then uh, you uh, have to be able to produce it at a cost. I think the, uh, uh, the uh, I think what's in that slide, uh, below a, a dollar and a half a kilogram. Mm -hmm. right. So, but uh, you know, low cost renewable electricity uh, is also uh, you know, stirring up a lot of new activity in electrolysis. So. Yeah, great, mm -hmm. great. And then from a business perspective, several people noted um, your experience with startups, and so the question is, um, what kind of cost or performance improvements? is needed now to attract VC interest or just to be relevant? You should ask the VCs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, um, the, the, the main point that I would make is that the, I, I do believe there's a gap between where we can get uh, with lithium ion. And you know, I love lithium ion. <laughs> it's not two companies that uh, make lithium ion batteries. Uh, the, you know, uh, at some point, the, 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 the mineral uh, prices uh, really are going to be the floor on those costs. Okay? And you know, uh, we, we see some studies with learning curves. And we actually published a paper last year which is modifying learning curves because you know, minerals often are you know, slow learners. Right? <laughs> so uh, so you know, you have to, if you're going to use a learning curve argument, you have to actually separate it and put a learning curve and apply a learning curve to, for instance, the development of the manufacturing technology, mm -hmm. but you have to have a different curve for the price of minerals. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so if you do that, that puts a floor on what lithium ion battery costs can be. And uh, you know, I, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, as long as we stick to cobalt, nickel, mm -hmm. uh, the transition metals that we currently are uh, focused on uh, for high energy density lithium ion, mm -hmm. uh, that the cost of minerals doesn't drop very much, and in fact, might go up. Mm -hmm. right? keep us from getting to that $100 a kilowatt hour number. Right. So that's why there is room for alternative uh, uh, chemistries. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we'll open up to questions. Um, here, I see one. Uh, have is Bert. You're going to get a mic there. Wait. I see uh, on the on the cold diffusion, uh, I have done an experiment uh, 31 years ago. We just implant Triton into a platinum foil until saturate. We can see it from RBS. Then detect proton, which is 100% uh, capture efficiency. There is no background because there's no, nothing in the accelerator. There's nothing when you stop the beam. When the beam is on, you see a huge amount of uh, fusion, real fusion. So I got a lot of uh, neutron radiation, but uh, no results, zero. Just to let you know. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, I think you should talk to Florian. <laughs> He's, uh, uh, Florian is, is uh, uh, at MIT, and he's working on an ion beam experiment. And I'm yeah. sure that uh, uh, he would have uh, okay. you, you have much who to is, talk about. Uh, yeah. You? Uh, OK, OK. Yeah, we just didn't publish it because we were so disappointed that you know, there's nothing, uh, there's no results. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hmm? Hi, Dr. Chang. Uh, Rafael Reyes uh, with Peninsula Clean Energy. We're the load serving entity for San Mateo County. Uh, and we have uh, what we believe to be the most aggressive uh, renewable energy target in, in California, targeting 100% renewable on a time coincident basis by 2025. 
Uh, needless to say, with that very aggressive target, uh, 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 dealing with long-duration batteries uh, is uh, something of special interest, and so your, your discussion about forum energy was particularly uh, uh, pertinent. So my question, I have two questions here. One is uh, what you see as the relative time frame around commercialization, number one, and then can you comment on the non technical barriers to entering the market because you've had now multiple experiences there and part of the re part of what we're learning is that uh, you know many technologies don't make it even despite the technical merits because they don't have the financial track record to get into the financing arena to be um, commercially viable yeah for sure there are a lot of uh, non-technical barriers I think uh, you know one thing I would say is that uh, when uh, when you design batteries uh, you at the when you're trying to show that the technology can work, you can't design them to an average need. You have to design them to a specific project. You know? And so you know, in something like power tools or cars, you know, if you produce something, a lot of people can buy that. But every utilities application is unique. And so uh, our approach is to find the best pilots and to focus on exactly what's needed for that, those pilots and to satisfy that exact profile, right? Uh, so that so uh, so we do. That's what all data analytics is, is about: is trying to find a you know a, a very close match uh, between the specific application and the technology, and then we'll worry about the next one that uh, th that might be slightly different. Right? Twenty twenty five is very soon, right? Um, yeah, uh, and uh, so it has to be scalable. Uh, I can say that our idea at form for scaling is that it has to be a, a technology that you don't need to you don't need to have purpose-built factories uh, in order to produce that device. Okay? Uh, ideally, it should be something you can produce uh, you know, with an EPC. Ideally, you can even you know, assemble it on site. Okay? So th that that's the kind of model that you know we think you really will need in order to be able to scale and to be able to de deploy. Um, 2025, the one thing that would be really hard to get by 2025 is you know, 20 years of uh, life cycling data, right? <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, and which of course comes to the warranty part of it as well, right? So, you know, how do you deal with that? Right? And, and the, you know, uh, that's clearly an issue. And I think the, um, with something, uh, so uh, conservatively, what you would try to do is to factor in some reasonable uh, replacement interval and not, you know, n not make a, a, you know, uh, a, a, a very aggressive uh, life prediction, uh, life uh, expectation. So for instance, halfway through life, maybe you have to replace all the chemicals, right? something like that. Right? But if it, can, if, it can, if it can work economically under scenarios like that, and you can design something, so you know, uh, we're not thinking in terms of what we know is a battery today. It has to be something that you can scale to very large capacity in a straightforward way without, as I said, building new factories. Uh, so uh, that, that's the kind of approach that we think can really speed things along. Yep. Yeah, how do you think about design? Where do you start thinking about design for manufacturing? So you got a little bit of that in there because you have the uh, cost per battery pack. Yep. But mm -hmm. as you're looking at these various chemistries, we've got to get the chemistry done. right. But then what are the implications? How do you think about design for manufacture? And then maybe you can help build it through. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you're referring to the grid storage. Uh, you know, looking for battery packs and vehicles, just in yep. general, as you're looking at these chemistries, you've got to put them together in a yeah. so, and integrate it into a design. Yeah. So I think that the, the type of battery we're think, envisioning for grid storage may or may not be a flow battery. Right? Uh, flow batteries have their, uh, have their uh, strengths, but they also, you know, there are some things you'd rather not have to do. Right? Um, they have to look more like chemical plants. Right? They, uh, the, the electrochemistry is the electrochemistry. There will be, for instance, anytime you have electrochemical uh, device, there are certain lens scales that are determined by transport rates of ions and electrons. And so you can't simply make them, for instance, arbitrarily large. Right? So there has to be some, uh, con there will be a constraint on the length scale of the, of, the, of the, let's call it the stack itself. 
but beyond that, I think that you, know, you really have to think about how do you make it more like a plant. Right? And so a, a form, you know, one of our most recent hires just this week is someone who's a reactor engineer, not a nuclear reactor engineer, a chemical reactor engineer. Right? So we're thinking about how do you build batteries that look like chemical reactors? And that's how we design for manufacturing. You know? Um, I heard an article that somebody said lithium is running out and it's not going to last as long as everybody's building batteries. Is that true or is that just scaremongering? Uh, so the, the uh, I'll tell you, cobalt is running out. <laughs> so before we run, long before we run short on lithium, uh, the, the, the greater focus has been on cobalt. Right? The last analyst I, uh, report I saw uh, two weeks ago uh, predicts that actually next year, at the continued rate of, uh, of EV sales, that existing cobalt production starts to be insufficient for, uh, for uh, uh, what the EV market will, will need. You know, more production would have to be brought online. If you bring on more production, that still will run out a few years beyond that. Right? So the trend is to first get the cobalt uh, out. And uh, so John Goodenough's uh, cathode was lithium cobalt oxide. So the metal part was 100% cobalt. Right? Today, uh, it's 20% cobalt in the most widely used EV formulation, which is nickel manganese cobalt. And it's 60% nickel, 20% cobalt. Right? And the version after that only has 10% cobalt. So we're kind of moving in that direction. Uh, but even moving that direction, there's going to be a cobalt issue. Right? Uh, the irony was that while everybody was focused on cobalt, the nickel price went up. Right? <laughs> And so for the high, you know, it turns out the high nickel content one is so-called 811, only 10% uh, cobalt and 80% uh, uh, nickel. You know, we reached a point where now that's more expensive than the, than the, the previous uh, higher cobalt one. Right? So we have to keep track of all of this. I think that eventually, um, f you know, eventually we have to move away from using these transition metals. Manganese, we've got plenty of, right? but nickel and cobalt, we don't. Uh, lithium is less of a concern right now than those transition metals. Uh, so the price of air has remained pretty constant. Uh, so what about using compressed air storage for uh, storing renewable uh, generated energy? Is that uh, going to be practical? Yeah, so there are only, uh, there are I think only two uh, existing uh, installations that do that. I showed a plot in which there are a number of uh, compre underground compressed air storage projects that were spec'd out but never built. But when you look at them, they, fair, they fall fairly closely on top of you know, the, the cost of a pumped hydro plant. Right? right now, we can't build pumped hydro plants in the United States either. Uh, but in China, there's a lot of pumped hydro being developed. Right? Uh, so. Uh, Fundamentally, from the, the, the cost point of view, compressed air does not seem crazy to me. Right? But it's, you know, the geological requirements are, are going to be some, a limitation on where you can put it. I honestly don't, don't quite understand why compressed air has not been able to get traction and, uh, in places where pumped hydro has. And it's probably just because pumped hydro is so much more uh, proven, having been you know, in, uh, first deployed in around the 1930s. It, it would seem like it's easier to, to do compressed air than uh, it would be to do uh, pumped hydro. Yeah, so I'll make an analogy. I, 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 put, uh, I put compressed air, pumped hydro, and very low cost grid store, electrochemical storage, all in the same bucket in the sense that they all have a very low cost working fluid, right? Water, air, or chemicals, but they're all very low cost, right? The majority of the cost ends up being in the hardware. And that's where it's at the system level and the hardware that you start to, uh, where the trade-offs and, and, and the head-to-head uh, and -head comparisons all take place. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Chen, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I'm hoping what I'm going to say will make you feel really well, because I happen to know Bob Langer pretty well. I'd worked with some of his portfolio. So he's, the pattern that they generating so much come behind a $100 million fund that he has for his 100 people. Uh, largest bio, um, I think, biomedical lab. So if you have a chart by per person, per capital received, 
pattern generated, I think you will do much better than Bob Langer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do not have a, a million dollars per researcher, <laughs> which is what you're saying Bob has. <laughs> now, anytime, you know, uh, anytime we want to feel inadequate, we just think about Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my question would be around the solid state lithium ion cells. You mentioned that the capacity of the storage is going up, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are as far as what the expectation should be. And also, the internal resistance of the cells are going to go up. Do you have any ideas by how much? Yeah, so let me ask the second question first, which is uh, really it's going to come down to uh, the thickness or thinness with which we can produce those solid electrolytes. Okay. And then there is uh, often an interfacial resistance that you have to figure out and design around. So, uh, so right now, uh, so it's a little hard to predict that because it's very uh, spe uh, specific to the electrolyte you use and the details of that chemistry. Right? But the, um, I don't think there's an intrinsic reason for internal resistance at the same the, uh, materials dimensions. Uh, to be higher in a solid state cell than in a liquid electrolyte cell. Right. Okay. In any specific case, it could be higher for, you know, for due to a certain re reaction. Uh, now your, but your other question was about what energy density improvement should we expect? And I think in round numbers, you would say a, a factor of two. Right. Uh, but that's a, uh, that's a moving target because lithium ion historically has you know, improved about 8% a year. Right. And so uh, while we're trying to get you know, lithium metal in, lithium ion based on still higher energy density, intercalation, cathodes, anodes, will still continue to improve. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and one final question. I saw this do, do you know if anybody has looked at energy storage like using locomotives running up inclines? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's, there's pump water and there's pump rocks. And then there's, and then there's and trains are, you know, are pump rocks. And uh, in fact, you know, you, you, it, it turns out that uh, the, the pump rock version, uh, SoftBank uh, recently made a, you know, an investment in. Uh, um, uh, I'm not remembering the name of the company right now. So uh, uh, yes, people have been uh, thinking about that. And uh, it, technically, it works. Right? The energy density is not very good, so you need to pump a lot of, you know, you need to have, a, you need a lot of locomotives. But if you have a lot of locomotives sitting around and you have a, a mountain and, and tracks, <laughs> could work. <laughs> Hard to deploy everywhere, though. <laughs> On that note, we're going to conclude here. Doug here has a f few final words, and we have a gift. So uh, one round of applause first. Right. Thank you. Thank you.